Welcome to Hillcrest. We are glad that you are taking the opportunity to view our latest video sermon. Our pastors are proud to offer another way for you to join with the church family in worship each Sunday. Please remember that live services are held at 8.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. every Sunday at Hillcrest on the corner of Halleck and Newland in Jamestown, New York. Now please enjoy today's sermon. Genesis chapter 15, read with me please. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer and a, and a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him cut them in two, arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kedmonites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Thanks for hanging in there. Well done, well done. Let's pray. Lord, we look for you to speak to us this morning. That's why we've come. We need to hear fresh word from you today. And so now, Lord, we just simply pray that what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So you may want to pull out the notes from your, your bulletin. And let's, let's dig into God's word for a few minutes together. This is the ninth and final message in this beginning series that we began in Genesis at the beginning of September, uh, where Genesis begins, right? We began, began with the beginning of the universe. And from there, we explored the importance of rest and how God has hardwired a need for a Sabbath rest. And I've been encouraged, many of you have shared how you're reprioritizing your schedules as I am to honor that Sabbath rest. Week three was focused on the beginning of sin and how the fall of the first man and, and woman has infected and affected everything negatively. And that led to a hard look at a conflict. And we explored the origins of that and how, how it's it, it, it affects everything we do. And from there, we went into the, the talk about the worldwide flood in week five. 
We explored the origin of nations and languages as God scattered the peoples across the, work, uh, the, the earth in week six. Week seven, we met a man named Abraham, the father of all who will believe. And we saw how Abraham heroically led a, a force, a special forces uh, um, to, to rescue his nephew Lot, who had been taken captive by pagan invaders during the First Worldwide War. And we talked about how Lot's rescue is, is really a picture of our own personal need for rescue from the slavery of sin, which is made available, as we just celebrated around this table, right? Through Abraham's seed, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, today, we come to the final message in this series, and to me, one of the most impactful messages or, or passages in the entire Bible. We're going to see the incredible power of the promise of God and how faith in God's promises conquers fear of every kind. So that's the title of the message this morning, Faith Conquers Fear. And we're going to see that faith anchored in the promises of God is the cure for every fear we face. So here's the question for you. What are you afraid of this morning? USA Today recently reported the results of a survey conducted by Chapman University called American Fears. It's an annual survey they do. And the study said that we are afraid as Americans of a lot of things. Did you know that? We are afraid of a lot of things. I mean, from terror attacks to natural disasters to identity theft to uh, terminal diseases to death itself. We are afraid of a lot of things. And, you know, I meet with people every week who are dealing with fear who are struggling because they're afraid of something or someone. Or, and so I ask, just ask you this morning, what are you afraid of this morning? Each of us has fears. Are, what are you afraid of today? And, and so my prayer for you this morning, as I've prayed throughout this week, is that you would not only be able to name your fear, but that you might be able, enabled by the grace of God to overcome that fear this morning. That's what happened to Abraham, as we're going to see, and it can happen to you today. So look with me again. Chapter 15, verse 1. After this, okay, let's just stop there a second. So after what? Well, if you were here last week, you know what it was, right? The, the Abraham led this special forces group of 318 trained men. Somebody asked me this week, well, who trained him? I think Abraham trained him. I think he, he knew exactly how to train these, these special forces. And so they chase after four armies of men who are thinking that they have won, right? And, and they save his nephew Lot. They had taken ne his nephew Lot. And so that was last week. If you missed last week, you can go online and listen to it. But it continues. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. This is the first mention in the Bible of the familiar phrase. Do not be afraid, right? right? Don't, don't, don't fear, after this, there will be more than 500 other instances where the Bible talks about fear. So fear is a universal thing. It's, it's, it's something that's common to all of us. And yet God says to us, do not fear. Do not be afraid. Now, why do you think Abraham was afraid? I can think of a few possibilities. And, and have you noticed, by the way, that when, when an angel shows up, we talk about this frequently, I usually call it out to you. When an angel shows up or, or there's some vision from the Lord, what's the reaction most of the time? Yeah, yeah, like fear. But I mean terror sort of fear. It's right, on a scale of 1 to 10, it's 100. It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, people freak out when they see an angel, don't they? Right? I remember I was thinking about the prophet Daniel. Daniel has this vision of the future delivered by the archangel Michael. And he, he says, I was stunned. I mean, I was just in total shock over that, that instance with Michael. And then think about uh, at the end of the, the Bible, right, in the book of the Revelation, chapter 1, also, John has this vision of the risen Lord Jesus. And he says this in Revelation chapter 1, I fell on my face as a dead man. It was total overload for him. So perhaps that is the case here for Abraham. So, so, so how does God begin? He, he begins and says, hey, chill out, right? I mean, relax. It's okay. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's one reason that might, he might be fearful. Another reason he might be afraid is, is just what happened, right? Just what had gone on. Remember, we talked about this last week, chapter 14. Abram leads these men to, to capture 
uh, recapture, his uh, rescue, his nephew Lot, but he's chasing after Kido Leomar, remember that name? And four kingdoms of armies, and so they think they've won. They've got Lot, they've, they've, they've trounced five other kingdoms that are living in the, uh, the lower uh, Jordan Valley, and um, they're, they're, going, they're headed home. And so the, the practice was you get far enough until it's safe, and then you set up camp and you party and you celebrate. Well, Abraham divides his forces, and by night, he attacks these partying, probably drunk soldiers, and it is chaos. They, they, are in, they are sent into panic, and they flee to the north as fast as they can in a full-blown retreat. But what if Cato Leomar, right, suddenly realizes, you know what, it's just a few hundred men. What are we doing retreating? And isn't it true that what-if game? I mean, that, that's a deadly one, isn't it? We play the what-if game, that'll, that'll drive you crazy. And so maybe Abraham was thinking, you know what, what, what if they return? I mean, if they, they return, I'm toast. So th there are lots of reasons. We could go on for quite a long time. Of reasons Abraham could have been afraid. But notice, God acknowledges Abraham's fear and exposes that fear. See, God knows everything, right? He knows everything about it, including why Abraham is afraid. So he calls it out and he says, Abraham, don't be afraid. But he not only exposes Abraham's fear, but notice, notice that God responds to Abraham's fear with a promise. What does he say? He says, I am your shield. Interesting. I am your shield. That word shield comes from the Hebrew word magain. And, and the idea is, is it's not describing, you know, a little uh, disc on, you know, an arm. You've seen these, right? A little, little shield you put up to for a, deflect an, arm, uh, an arrow or somebody coming at you. No, no. The imagery is much more like a full body shield. You've seen riot police, right? And they'll have a full-blown shield and you get behind that. Um, in Roman days, um, they, they called this the war door. You get behind that shield and your whole body is safe because it's behind the shield. I believe that's the imagery that the Lord's drawing on here. He says, I am your shield. I am your very great reward. And this, this promise is an abbreviated version of the promise that God had already given Abram in detail back in chapter 12. In fact, let's just turn back there. Probably just a page back. Genesis chapter 12. Turn back there. Notice with me again. <laughs> Chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. I will make you into a great nation. This is God speaking to Abram. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then add to that, skip down to verse 7. Um, it says, to your offspring, I will give this land. All right, and then, then move over to chapter 13 and look down to uh, verse 14, chapter 13, verse 14. And God says, lift up your eyes from where you are and look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west. All the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that anyone who would, could count it could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. See, God, God made a big, beautiful promise to Abraham. And what was it? In, in a nutshell, God promised that Abraham would be the father of a great nation, a father of a great people, a father of a great land, a great in blessing. But there's a little problem here, Right? Notice the conversation that goes on between Abraham and the Lord. Verse 2. But Abraham said, Oh, sovereign Lord. He's respectful. right? Oh, sovereign Lord. What can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. What's Abraham saying? What's he saying? He's saying, God, I hear your promises. I mean, I hear it. I hear it, but there's a little problem here. 
I mean, to be the father of a nation requires what? A children. At least one child. I don't even have that, God. So all these promises are good and great and gracious and all the rest. But you know what, God? Talk is cheap. And so far, that's all I've got is your promises. And in case you haven't noticed, you know what? The clock is ticking. I mean, put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Try to imagine where you, where, what you would be thinking. More of actually, it's Abraham's sandals, all right? Put yourself there. So when God calls Abraham in chapter 12, how old is Abraham? Anybody remember? He's 75 years old. Um, I think that's past childbearing age, typically, for most, right? Now, here, chapter 15, he's 85. I mean, this promise seemed impossible to Abraham, because he's childless. God, you know, 75, that's way too old to have kids. And now I'm 85, and you're still promising children. I mean, okay, but where are they? Where, where are the kids, God? And so Abraham says, you know, the only heir I've got is Eliezer of Damascus. Now, let's, let's think about this. Now, Abraham obviously had a brother who died, right, because he raised his nephew, Lot, well, Lot was, grew up in his house, household. Lot would have been a, an heir, but he's not mentioned here. It's interesting. That's another side tangent. All Abraham mentions is this guy named Eliezer. Oh, the world's Eliezer. I don't know. I mean, some, some historians point to the fact that Damascus, he mentions Eliezer of Damascus, that Damascus was like a center, a commerce center. So probably a lot of banking sort of activity going on. So Abraham's filthy rich, they say. He's, he's loaded. He is very wealthy. So maybe this guy, a. Eliezer of Damascus, is his banker. So some say. So Eliezer of Damascus would be like saying uh, Billy from Bank of America or, or Chet from, you know, Chase Bank. That's what they say. It's, it's that idea. Maybe. Maybe. It's not clear who Eliezer of Damascus is, but what is clear is there seems to be more than a little problem with God's big promise. And Abraham is saying, you know what, Lord, all, all these promises are really cool. I don't, I don't have a problem with any of the promises. I, I, I love you, Lord, for your encouraging words. I love that. But so far, it just sounds like sentiment to me. I mean, what good is all the land and all the wealth in the world if I don't have any kids to share them with? Do you, hear, do you hear Abraham's confusion here? The fear in Abraham's response to the Lord? I do. So how does, how does, a, how does God deal with Abraham's confusion and his fear? Does he say, well, all right, Abraham, just pull up a chair and, and, and let, me, let me try to explain what I'm doing here. Let, let me just tell you, you know, how it's going to work and... Um, I'll just let you in on my timing and let you know the details of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Does he do that? Uh, no, he doesn't do that. Not at all. And you know why? You know why? When we're down, when we're really depressed, right, the last thing we need is a full-blown dissertation on details. Am I right? Well, the problem is this. That's not what we need. What we really need is reassurance that what we've been promised is actually going to happen. I mean, let's, let me give you an example. Let's say, God forbid, right, you get a call while you're in the service. Now, I know none of you would answer your phone now, but let's say, say you answered the phone as you left the service today, and, and the person on the other line says, you know what, your house is on fire, or the apartment that you live in. Your house, your, your apartment's on fire. Now, at that moment, do you really want to hear that, you know, it was a mouse that chewed through the extension cord up in the guest bedroom or, or it was a little short in the socket up in the bathroom and it caught the curtains on fire and it spread to this room? No. What do you want to hear? Is the fire department on the way? Right? Is my house going to be there when I get home? You want some reassurance that it's going to be okay. See, we live by promises, not by explanations. Right? That's what we need. And that's what Abraham needed. So what God does is he reinforces the promise that he's already made by giving him an awesome example. This is amazing. So look at verse 5. God takes Abraham outside and he says, look up at the heavens and count the stars. 
if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So no, notice that God doesn't belittle Abraham, right? He said, you know, Abraham, you are such a schmuck. What a, what a loser you are. I mean, you are, you're such a faithless doofus, Abraham. He doesn't do that, does he? No, he just takes him outside. And he's very patient with him. He, he's gracious with him. And, and he just takes the promise that he's already made and he repeats it, and then he helps him understand it through a powerful visual. How, how many of you have been outside recently and looked up at the stars and just had a moment of worship? And my prayer for you is the next time you're out and you look up at the stars, you'll think of this promise. Because this is some of what is there. This is some of what is there. And, and you know what? There, there, are about, there are billions upon billions of stars in our Milky Way. And our Milky Way is one of billions of galaxies in the known universe. This is a stunning reality. The extent of God's promise and that God says, look up. That's what I'm going to do with you, through you. So notice Abraham's response now, verse 6. Read it with me. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Read it again. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. God reiterates the promise. Abraham believes it, and God credits his faith as righteousness. This is one of the key, the key verses in the Bible. Some have called this the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. I, I'm not going to argue with that. Let's break it down. There's three key words in this key verse. First, there's the word believe, right? In the Hebrew, it's related to the word amen, which means yes. Let it be as, as justice has been declared. Yes. It, it has the idea of just putting your total weight, all your hope in that, whatever that is. Right? So Abram believed. That's the first key word. The second key word is credited. And this is, this is a banking term. It means crediting to your account, something being credited to one's account. So just as you make a deposit, right? You put your checks in the bank or cash or whatever, you put it in the, in the bank, it's credited to your account. God credits Abraham's spiritual account with righteousness because of his faith. So believe, credited, and then the third word is righteousness. And this refers to the moral perfection that God demands. Nothing less. Only perfect, do you understand? It's only perfect people are getting to heaven. Only perfect people get to heaven. God doesn't grade it on a curve. Doesn't work that way. You've heard me say this before. If you have this idea that there's, you know, this, this big cosmic set of scales up in the sky where God weighs your good against your bad, and if the good outweigh the bad, you're in, you're, it doesn't work that way. No, no. Only perfect people. Only people with the perfect score. Make it. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It's that perfection that God demands. And the same principle works for us today. To be saved, to be a believer, a genuine believer, is not to give mental assent to, yeah, yeah, I think that probably happened, sure. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that. A lot of people don't have a problem with anything except Jesus, and believing fully in him. And to believe fully in, me, in him means that you understand what we just celebrated, that he died on a cross for you. And that he rose from the dead for you on the third day, and that he will save you. He will give you a hope and a future if you, including eternity in heaven, right? If you will put your full weight and trust, not in yourself, but in him. Righteousness becomes yours by faith. In theological terms, it's imputed to you. It's impu you don't earn it. You can't do anything to earn it. All right, so then, verse 7. God reiterates the promise to give Abraham the land of Canaan. And see it there. And then verse 8 says, but, but Abraham said, Oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So, you see, that still doesn't have any kids, right? <laughs> still doesn't have the land. <clears throat> How can I know that I will gain possession of it? And so then what follows is a description, frankly, that's, that's foreign to most of us today. 
And, and if you skip down to verse 18, it says, on that day, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Now today, you know, if, if you want to enter into agreement, what do you do? You go to a lawyer and you drop a piece of paper and you, and you, you might sign on the dotted line. Um, you know, you shake hands in agreement, that sort of thing. But in those days, the way you, you made, a co- you made a, an agreement, a covenant like this, is you cut an animal in half, several animals, and you arrange them, halves, on either side, and the two people making the agreement walk between them. And you know what the gist was? If either of us breaks this agreement, may this happen to us. That, that's what a covenant means. There is no more solemn vow than to make a covenant. That's why marriage is so so deeply serious. When I counsel um, uh, couples, you know, premarital counseling, right, we talk about the covenant. This isn't an agreement to be renegotiated as we want to. So let's talk about it up front, how this is going to work. So, so God tells Abraham to, to prepare the animals, and he does it. He kills them, he cuts them in half, he ranges them, and then what does Abraham do? He waits. And he waits. And he waits. Verse 12. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then the Lord reveals to Abraham how hundreds of years later, Moses would lead his descendants, Abraham's descendants, out of slavery after 400 years. It's amazing. This is, this is brought to Abraham. He sees this, you know, this prophetically in the future, out of slavery in Egypt. So now we're, we're at verse 17. And, and when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. So, so when it's dark, God finally shows up. And Abraham spent, I mean, he's exhausted. Now, now question, have you thought about this? Why did God wait so long? What's up with that? I mean, he tells Abraham to prepare for the covenant, to take the animals and just to prepare for the covenant, right? And then he waits and waits and waits and waits. Why did he do that? My answer, and it's not, I'm, it's not new with me. He wanted, to, he wanted to make sure Abraham was totally, completely drained of himself. He was totally spent and unable to participate in the covenant. Yep. All he could do is watch as a burning torch, which always, always symbolizes the presence of God, a burning torch passes between pieces. In other words, God promise, God's promise to Abraham was confirmed by a unilateral covenant. A unilateral covenant. This, this, is, this is not a, prob- a promise that God is making, you know, contingent on Abram holding up his end of the bargain or, or keeping or, or doing anything at all. God was saying, I am going to bless you. I am going to make your name great. I am going to give your descendants the land. It is my solemn oath and promise to you. I will do it all. So verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. And all of those people's are unknown today. You know what peoples are known today? The Jews. Interesting. So let's bring this home. We've seen how God dealt with Abraham's fear. How his faith in God's promise was the conquering force. And and, and so how he pressed in and leaned into God's reiteration of the promise right when he saw the stars in the sky. He was blown away. He believed God, and it was credit to him as righteousness. But what about you and me? I have three points of application very quickly. 
in your notes. Realize, recognize, and respond. I asked you at the beginning of the message, what, what are you afraid of this morning? What, what is your greatest fear? You know what it is. So write it down. Name it. I don't believe you can fully deal with your fears until you're able to name your fear. Right? Write it down. Write it down. There's a spot for you to do. Call it out. Is it your health? Is it the health of your spouse? Is it money? Is it um, loneliness? Is it your parents? Is it your kids? What's your greatest fear? Is it your spouse? Don't live in denial about your fears. God never asks us to do that. Come to the realization that your greatest fear, God already knows, right? So call it out, write it down. And then number two, recognize this truth. Here it is. God is greater than my fear. Say that with me. God is greater than my, and, and you need, God is greater than my fear. God is greater than my fear. When, some of you remember that when Moses was leading the people out of Egypt, out of the slavery in Egypt, right? That's alluded to here, to the promised land. That there were many, I mean, many, many tough seasons, deep valleys he went through. And, and, and he would complain to the Lord about the people and their, their murmuring and just how exhausting it was as, as a leader to, to lead them. And the Lord would say to him, Moses, is my arm too short to save You get it? God, God is greater than your fear. He's greater than your greatest need. He's greater than your greatest weakness. So say, say that with me again. God is greater than my fear. God is greater than my fear. And that recognition should lead you, number three, to responding by believing in God's promise. What did God promise to you? Do you know that God has made all kinds of promises to you. Deuteronomy chapter 31. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. You know what? Some of us have been abandoned. We, we have been abandoned and let down and deserted and left in the lurch by somebody. Maybe it's our parents growing up. Maybe it's been a spouse. Some, somebody. And so what we do is we project that fear, that brokenness on God. And when we think he's going to fail to come through, we, we think he's going to abandon us. And, and the, Lord, yet the Lord says to us this morning, I will never leave you or forsake you. I love the promise of Psalm 23, right? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that, that is a really deep valley. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You are with me. You're with me. Love the promise of Romans 8, 28, right? God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. What does God promise you? Here's a good exercise for you this week. If you're living in fear, fear is dominating you, spend some time researching and seeking out the promises of God. I've got one tool that'll help. I made some copies of a, an article that I think is great. It's going to take you deep. It's called, I Am the Good Shepherd. And it'll take you to a place of wonder again and worship at the promises of God from Psalm 23. We've got quite a few copies of it available. Only take it if you're going to do something with it this week, though. Right? But if you want to go deeper, it's on the long tables as you leave this morning. Let me lead us in prayer. I'm convinced every time we open this book, we ought to respond. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you in the quietness of your heart to say, Lord, you know my fear, and here it is. Now, some of us have, have not been able to name our fear. It's too painful. Others of us uh, have talked to the Lord we think too many times, but talk to him again this morning and say, Lord, this is it. You know this is it because you know all things. And this morning, just say to the Lord, God, I do believe, I see again that you are greater than my fear. 
You are greater than whatever it is that has me worried, fretting, stressed. And then say to him today, Lord, I, I, I believe the promise that you will never leave me. You will never forsake me. God, that you are working good things even in the hard times. Even in the valley, Lord, you are there. You haven't left me. You won't leave me. Your promises are as sure as, as the rising of the sun. And so, Lord, for all of this, we thank you. And God, I praise you for these past nine weeks that we've explored the beginnings of everything. Thank you for the ways that you're growing and teaching us and causing us to go deep in faith. And I pray for each of us today that that's exactly what would happen in the days ahead. For we pray in Jesus' name, we all said, Amen.